morning and welcome to worship at Lake Harbor United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Mary Ivana, and it's a blessing to worship together this morning. I want to offer a special welcome to those who are joining us online and invite, uh, if you are, invite you to let us know that you're worshiping with us with a comment or uh, praying with your hands or a heart. It's always good to know that uh, we are gathered together with a larger community. And I invite you to join me this morning as we share the peace of Christ. What a blessing uh, to do that together. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. It is good to be gathered together. Uh, Today, we continue a series uh, on cat fruits, those things we sometimes say that may not ring completely true when we think about our faith and life together. And today, uh, the one that we'll focus on is God helps those who help themselves. Uh, So our call to worship this morning is Psalm 121, and I would invite you to rise in body or spirit, uh, stand as you're comfortable, and I'm grateful for Larry Jorgensen, who is here uh, as our worship leader this morning and will lead us. I will lift up my eyes to the hills, from whence does my help. My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade by your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Our help comes from God. Let's sing sing praise praise to our helper. And so we'll sing together four verses of O God, Our Help in Angels Past. this series on half-truths last Sunday, looking at this chair and this table cut in half and realizing that neither one offers us a firm foundation. As a reminder that some of our long-held beliefs and cliches aren't altogether accurate or helpful either. We want to offer love and grace in Jesus' name, not spiritual platitudes that can harm others. So today we take on that popular saying, God helps those who help themselves. Some think it comes straight out of Scripture, but it doesn't. Maybe we've heard it or said it. Anybody heard it or said it? But we have, have we really thought about what it means or what it says to someone who needs help. Surely there's a value in personal responsibility, and Scripture has words about the value of meaningful work. However, 
all of us have stood in need of help at some time or another. If you are someone who says, I have never needed anybody else's help, I want to talk to you. To use this phrase casually downplays both the work that God does as our helper and the call that we have to love and serve our neighbor, the one in need. And so I invite you to see uh, a short uh, video on half-truths that will uh, help us make those connections. grateful uh, as we gather for those who will help us each week to think a little more deeply about the half-truth that we're focusing on. And so today, uh, Larry's going to share with us. About uh, 25 years ago, I got a call from the doctor, from the doctor himself. You know, that's never good. And uh, it turned out that it was cancerous. And, you know, you know I, I had like a two-week pity party. I didn't know what to do with myself, and I felt bad. So I got that taken care of, went through radiation, all that good stuff. And here I am today. And I'm happy about it. But Bonnie was my steadfast during that whole time and kept me going. You know, it was, it's kind of weird how things work out. My dad uh, came from Sweden, and he was very dedicated to this country. And he was really involved in volunteerism. Uh, I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember the guys that used to go out at night with the white hats, that said CD on the front. He would make sure everybody had their lights turned off during the Second World War. And it was uh, kind of strange to see that. But then he became one of the first firemen in Norton Township, as it was known then. And I guess volunteerism is in my blood. I think that at the time I didn't realize it, but I did a lot of volunteerism. And I didn't realize that. In James chapter 2, it talks about deeds and faith. And on, I didn't really have that much it's called faith. I was raised in the church. But uh, I think that it really impressed me, and my dad impressed me. Several years later, I had the chance to go to get, uh, New Orleans to help at Katrina. And the devastation that I saw there was mind-blowing. Uh, you know, people had moved out because they were going to Houston, Texas, or other places where they could stay with relatives. Uh, the houses were smashed. Um, water lines on houses were up to the second floor, um, and nobody was actually living there. Um, that kind of turned my faith inward. And I was so glad that I could help as little as it was. And all the other churches and volunteers that came to help down there, those people had nothing. They didn't know where to start. They were lost and in need of big help. I'm just thankful that at that time, I could be one of the ones that helped them. And uh, I think that anybody that does that has the heart and hands of God in them. So today we're talking about 
flipping the script as we think about these half truths. Uh, we might hear that half truth, God helps those who help themselves. But flipping the script, we might say, Grace and mercy show us that God helps those who cannot help themselves. So that's our focus today. Uh, and I would invite you um, to uh, join us in prayer this morning. Here is going to lead us. The prayer of the day. God, Father of us all, your Son Jesus was born among us, poor, humble, and dependent. Open our eyes and our hearts and our hands to honor Him now as our Lord and King by welcoming Him, welcoming him and those who are hungry and thirsty, and all who are abandoned and alone and refugees and the poor and the sick. You don't leave us or forsake us. You offer us salvation as a gift, not something we earn. We know your love through the help of others. Let our hearts love flow more freely, like the tenderness you have shown us in your son. Just as you are our helper, help us to help others graciously and joyfully. Amen. Thanks to Larry for sharing with us. Uh, we're grateful today that uh, as we think about a new program year, a new fall start, uh, we have a small group of our choir here to offer the ministry of music. Uh, this song is called Come Ye Sinners Poor and Needy. Some of you may know it. Uh, it was um, first shared in the 1700s, but it's uh, a deeply um, meaningful song, I think. And as we think about God's help for us, especially in terms of God's grace in our lives, uh, offering us salvation, uh, we hope these words will be a blessing to you this morning.
say a word of thanks uh, to Michael, who is offering the Ministry of Music today and, and supporting our Ministry of Music this morning. It is a blessing. Uh, so I want to invite those who are young and young at heart to play, pay close attention this morning. And uh, we're going to say good morning on the count of three. And know that those who are joining us uh, virtually are responding. They tell me they do, uh, which is interesting. So here we go. One, two, three. Good morning. It's good to be gathered together. So uh, today we're talking about the people who help us. Uh, and that God helps us. But I think the, the way that we know God helps us is because of people who help us. Uh, I want to show you first a uh, comic. How many of you know who Dennis the Menace is? Right. Um, so even as we're thinking about these half-truths, if you can't read it, I'll read it for you. Didn't you hear the preacher say, the Lord helps those who help themselves? And Dennis has um, cookies, the cookie jar. Yeah, I don't think that's what anybody means, but okay. Uh, but we hear that phrase sometimes, that God helps those who help themselves. Now, that sometimes means um, there's some truth to that, right? We need to help do the things that we can do. Uh, to, uh, we can't just think that things are going to be done for us all the time. That's really true. But there are times when people need help. Um, so maybe, for those of you who are in school, maybe you've seen somebody who needs help doing their work. Maybe you've seen somebody who needs help uh, because something spilled on the floor. Um, do we just sit by and let just things spill on the floor and we don't, we don't help people? Usually we, we get up when we help, when somebody needs help. And they help us, and that's how things, uh, that's how it works. We need to help each other. Um, so today... I want to show you a picture of uh, somebody, someone who some of you might recognize, not everybody. Um, this is Mr. Rogers. And some of you might have heard that um, there was a time when uh, some really difficult things happened. It happened 21 years ago. And one of the things, and, and some people went to Mr. Rogers because they wanted him to sort of give some guidance on how do we, how do we deal with this. And one of the things he said was, look for the helpers. Look for all the helpers, the people who are uh, helping people after a tragedy, after something really difficult happens. And so we think about um, first responders and people who open their homes and open their churches and all the ways that we can help each other. Because when we help each other, uh, I think Jesus would say, that's part, we're going to read a, a scripture today, where Jesus says, you know, when you helped me, when you helped the people who were in need, you helped me. And that's a really important thing for us to remember. So I want all of us to think about somebody who's helped you in the last week uh, when you needed help and pray for them. Uh, maybe send them a note or a text. Uh, just say thank you for, for being a helper. Um, and for some of you who started school recently, think about all the people who help at school, whether it's your teacher or somebody who works in your classroom, or the person who makes lunch, or the person who drives your bus, or somebody who works in the office, or somebody who uh, maybe outside of school coaches on your team. There's lots and lots of people. Uh, when we talked a few weeks ago, when we were blessing backpacks, we talked about all those people who help us. And we couldn't really do that. We couldn't make, uh, we couldn't go to school without them. We couldn't do the things we love to do without them. So today I also want to offer uh, a time of prayer and uh, this Kate is here. Kate Robbins, our director of our um, of children's Christian education. Uh, we start Sunday school today, and so for uh, kids and youth, we have uh, those programs ready to go. Um, we're grateful for those who are uh, leading that, facilitating that, helping to educate uh, our children and youth in the faith. And so I'm going to invite Kate forward. Uh, as a representative of all our teachers and the good work that they do uh, and the ways that they will help us this year to know God better, to understand and understand how deeply God loves us. So would you uh, just open your hands in a gesture of blessing? And for all of you online, open your hands in a gesture of blessing as well uh, as we offer a blessing for those who will uh, teach and lead and 
And if you're here and uh, had somebody who was one of your teachers uh, in the church, some of you might have had a Sunday school teacher who was special to you. I invite you to remember them, give thanks for them as well. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for the ways that you call us to serve. Today we especially pray for those who will lead our Christian education classes this year. Uh, for the work that they'll do together, for the things that they'll teach, for the time that they'll spend, for the care that they'll offer, uh, for the insights that they'll offer, and for the things that they'll hear, for the ways that they help us be in ministry with children and with our young people. We are grateful. So give them strength. Give them grace. Be with our families as they make those commitments uh, to bring their children to receive uh, Christian education, to be involved in that, to know that it changes our lives and helps us to love and serve you better. Guide us, we pray, in the name and spirit of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our friend. Amen. All right. Thank you. As we come to a time, uh, move into a time of offering, I also want to share a couple of announcements with you, uh, an invitation. If you have prayer requests to offer, we do have an email prayer chain that you can join at any time if you'd like uh, by notifying the office. Uh, but if you have a prayer that you'd like to share, you can fill out a blue prayer slip. If you're here in person, you can send it in online, uh, office at lakeharborumc.org, and we will share that. I uh, want to invite you to um, pick up devotional materials, the daily devotional, if that's helpful to you. We also have that online every day. Uh, our newsletter is printed out if you need a copy. Uh, and also uh, books that go along with our series, Half Trees, are available if you'd like to purchase one. Uh, some activities this week to uh, keep in mind. Grief Share is uh, meeting on Monday, Monday night, 6.30, in our fellowship hall. Uh, Bible study continues on Tuesday mornings. This week we serve at the Map Clothing Closet on Tuesday and Thursday. And so if you're interested in that, you can contact the office and we'll get, uh, get you connected where you need to be. This Wednesday, we have our luncheon for our 80-plus crowd, uh, and that's always a blessing, especially to think about uh, the number of years many of them have uh, been connected at Lake Harbor and have served in, in many capacities, so we're looking forward to that. Our social justice small group meets this Thursday evening, and then coming up in a couple, uh, a week from Tuesday is our next worship brainstorming time, and so uh, we do have those information packets if you are interested in uh, looking ahead and, and planning with us, we hope that you would join us on the 20th uh, for a lunchtime uh, brainstorming time. And then coming up also uh, in early October, every uh, first Sunday of October here in Muskegon is our crop walk. And so we have some walkers already. If you're interested in walking, we can get you a pledge sheet. Uh, if you're interested in pledging, we can make those connections. So uh, we're grateful to be able to participate in that. Uh, as we come to our time of offering, I want to thank uh, uh, people for some of the ways they've served this week and offered their time. For those who were at Supper House uh, this week helping uh, our community, I'm grateful for the group that offered time and gathered for our yearly worship planning retreat on Friday and Saturday. We accomplished a lot together and are looking forward to this next year in worship and I uh, want to thank you for praying for us. Uh, the, the ways that we give time and talent and treasure really makes ministry and mission possible. And so I'm grateful for the ways that God uh, encourages us to give. A reminder this month that our noisy offering will support our United Methodist Campus Ministries in Michigan. And so uh, you can put that in the noisy offering cans during our offering time uh, or send it in. Uh, during this time when we have offering, we will... Uh, take some time to read the God moments that were shared from this past week. And again, you're encouraged uh, to make that offering. That's an offering too, an offering of our witness together. Uh, so uh, Michael will offer some music and we'll read those uh, as we take this time for offering. Again, uh, if you're here in the sanctuary, offering plates are at the back. If you're joining us online, you can give online at lakeharborumc.org. Let's worship God together this morning.
Let's sing one more time. Jesus, we are here. Jesus, we are here. Jesus, we are here. We are here. And I would invite you to pray with me this morning. As we offer our gifts and lives in this moment, may we become those who reflect your love and grace to the world. You hold nothing back from us. Help us to be generous with all that you've given to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I pray that God would open our hearts to the reading of the word this morning. There are two more scriptures I want to share uh, in addition to Psalm 121. The first comes from Matthew 25. This is uh, a portion of the parable of the sheep and the goats. And this is from the message. When he finally arrives, blazing in beauty and all his angels with him, the Son of Man will take his place on his glorious throne. Then all the nations will be arranged before him, and he will sort the people out, much as a shepherd sorts out sheep and goats, putting sheep to his right and goats to his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Enter you who are blessed by my Father. Take what's coming to you in this kingdom. It's been ready for you since the world's foundation. And here's why. I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was homeless, and you gave me a room. I was shivering, and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you stopped to visit. I was in prison and you came to me. Then those sheep are going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we ever see you sick or in prison and come to you? Then the king will say, I'm telling the solemn truth. Whenever you did one of these things that someone overlooked or ignored, that was me. You did it to me. And then from Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus, this is Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated with us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If I asked you where to find God helps those who help themselves in Scripture, now you might think it's in Scripture, it sounds like a verse in Proverbs or something from what we call wisdom literature. It sounds like good advice. Some people might think it comes straight out of Jesus' mouth, but they'd be wrong. Jesus never said it, even though some people are convinced he did, and no, it's nowhere to be found in Scripture, and so we can file it under stuff Jesus didn't say. God helps those who help themselves. Hashtag stuff Jesus never said. But it sounds true, right? It's something I want to say when someone needs a boost of encouragement or maybe a kick in the behind. Most of the time, though, we hear it in conversations and discussions about those living in poverty. Perhaps you heard it as a reaction after the recent announcement about student loan debt forgiveness. Now, I know that's a whole other issue for a whole other day. And in case you're wondering, there are numerous opinions about Scripture's directive on debt forgiveness as it relates 
specifically to student loan debt. We debated it at annual conference this year. But God helps those who help themselves is another cliche that can do real damage if we're not careful. What does it say about who God is and what God is like? God helps those who are working hard and doesn't care about the rest. How do we measure hard work if that's our goal? How do we measure it? Now, my dad was a farmer for a lot of years. My dad worked hard. My dad worked too much. Does my dad, the farmer's hard work, mean more than someone else's? we start kind of digging a little more deeply into this, it's a little bit problematic. Besides being an untrue theological statement, God helps those who help themselves, encourages us to start judging one another. Maybe there's a bit of truth to it, but we do well to sit with it for a while and really think about it. I told you last week that in our discussions about these half-truths, Carol had said that these expressions are like those verbal emojis things that we say quickly to make ourselves feel better. God helps those who help themselves might point us to the importance of personal responsibility, which is legitimate on some level, but it's usually not the whole story. Our lives are more complex than that. And again, if you're somebody who says, well, I've never gotten any help from anybody, please come talk to me. I have a few questions. Surely we understand that we don't sit around and pray for food on the table or employment. We have to do something, which means using what's available to us, our abilities, our connections to get what we need. And yet we know there are people who struggle to do that. It is difficult. So we live in this tension. Even Paul, the Apostle Paul, had to confront early Christians who quit working and sat waiting for Jesus' imminent return which they thought would happen any time. So if you hear somebody quote from Thessalonians, those who work shouldn't eat, that's where that comes from. Paul said it, but it was in response to people who had said, you know what, we're just waiting for Jesus to come back. We're just going to wait. We don't need to do anything because he's coming any day now. From a spiritual standpoint, prayer and worship empower us to act on the faith we claim. We trust that God is at work for good as we rely on God, and we live with an active faith. We need help, and we offer help. We pray for God's kingdom to come, and we work and act for the sake of God's kingdom. When we offer thoughts and prayers for society's struggles, we have to back it up with action and advocacy and awareness and involvement that seeks to make the world more like the kingdom of God. If we want some history on where this phrase, God helps those who help themselves, comes from, we have to look way back to ancient Greece, probably around the 5th century B.C. or so, in Aesop. Anybody know Aesop's fables? Aesop was a man famous for fables and stories. And so this is uh, one illustration of a fable called Hercules and the Wagoner. Uh, this is from 1887, but we figured this was probably 5th century B.C. or so. And this is what it says there, Hercules and the Wagoner. When the god saw the Wagoner kneel, crying, Hercules, lift, my, lift me my wheel from the mud where it's stuck. He laughed, no such luck, set your shoulder yourself to the wheel. The gods help those who help themselves. That's where it's from. So we hear it in that conversation between Hercules and the Wagoner. God helps those who help themselves stayed around and was actually made even more popular by Benjamin Franklin in the 1730s in Poor Richard's Almanac. That's really where it comes from in its present form. And this is what this says. However, let us hearken to good advice and something may be done for us. God helps them that help themselves, as poor Richard says in his almanac of 1732. So it's not from Jesus, but it's from Benjamin Franklin and before him, Aesop. Surely there's maybe some wisdom in it, and yet to say that it's biblical truth just isn't true. But it does 
this half truth truth contains a, a very deep truth. If we sort of stop at the beginning, God helps. That's true. It's more accurate to say that God helps those who are helpless, and God helps when we can't help ourselves. If we consider our spiritual lives, we are helpless before God. Paul starts a letter to the Ephesians with a reminder of God's work to save us. By grace you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God so that no one can boast. God forgives us. God gives us second and third and fourth and twentieth chances. Anybody had a few of those? We are helpless when it comes to salvation. Grace really is a free gift that we receive. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. But God, who is rich in mercy, Paul says. God, who is rich in mercy. God, who loves us. Offers us that gift that we can receive by faith. And God's help is a basis for our need and relationship with God. That's why we have a relationship with God, because we need it. Psalm 121 is a song that people sang together as they were traveling to Jerusalem, specifically to the temple there. It wasn't much, it wasn't really climbing a mountain like we might think of a mountain, but getting up this long incline to a city on a hill, an elevation of about 2,700 feet with a diverse topography to navigate on the way there. And so Psalm 121 I lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come. The psalm focuses on God's constant care at all times, even in the heat of the day when they needed shade and in the cool and potential danger of the dark night when they needed protection. My help comes from God, the maker of heaven and earth. The psalm offers the promise of God's presence, and for those travelers, this isn't just anyone who provides help. It's God who helps maker of heaven and earth. God is our keeper, protecting us, not allowing for our mistakes to overtake us. Is there anybody who's made some mistakes that could have overtaken you? Offering us grace and mercy on the journey, just like making our way across difficult terrain with the potential for stumbling and falling or getting injured, we depend on God to help us on our journey. And then you get the parable that Jesus tells about sheep and goats, and it's sometimes difficult to hear because none of us gets off without some level of discomfort. It's about the last judgment, Matthew 25, and how God will judge us for what we've done or what we haven't done. And that's sometimes the kicker for what we haven't done, too. I'm always struck by the fact that those who have cared for the least of these don't realize that they were caring for Christ himself. The king is pretty straightforward about what help is given, feeding the hungry, offering water to the thirsty, welcoming the stranger, clothing the naked, caring for the sick, and visiting the prisoner. It confronts our humanity in how we view others. And I'll be honest that even as I read those six calls to help, sometimes I find myself asking questions. Have you ever asked the questions, how do I know that this person really needs help? Do they really need it? Is there something they can do? Anybody with me or am I the only one? How do they not have what they need? to make this happen. Judgment creeps in so very, very quickly into our hearts. And how do I know? The answer is I don't know. We help because someone's in need. If we're clear on the majority of Jesus' parables when he talks about helping others, most of the time, especially when he talks about who a neighbor is, a neighbor's the person in need. That's the definition. If I can blame someone for their struggle, then I don't have to do anything about it. And I'm pretty good sometimes at kind of going to that place of blame. Well, they should have done this. Why didn't they just do this different? Am I alone in this? I hope not. 
I don't need to help in the present moment, and I can avoid, avoid the challenge of looking at the bigger picture to see why someone is struggling and needing help, considering maybe justice issues and other issues that are just hard, and they take a little bit more thinking on our end. Jesus addresses poverty in many ways through his ministry, especially reaching out to those who are marginalized. And he's clear that the poor will always be with us. He says that. Not as a reason to ignore the plight of those who live in poverty, but as a reminder that this is the reality that we live in. It's our community. There are people whose lives have been rough for many reasons, some in their control, some not in their control. We know people who are trying to make ends meet. If you have some conversations in the present day with people, weighing the cost of child care and food and transportation and rent up against the cost of going to work, it is sometimes a difficult tension to hold. That's not an excuse. That's simply a reality. It's not so simple for a person on one income to make it work. Not one of us is self-made. We've had help and support along the way. And if I think about the reality for me and for my family, the amount of help that has come from other people is incredible. Whether it was help navigating a new country, just help as a neighbor or a friend, help with a place to stay. For our family, help with child care that we didn't have to pay for because it came from family. Anybody receive that kind of help? Help with food from family who just makes food and brings it to you. Help from a neighbor when you break your arm. Remember when I broke my wrist? That's a whole new level of help, friends. I love my husband, but there are things, you know, that you got to do when you have a broken wrist that you can't do. If he would have said, God helps those who help themselves, I would have been a little bit upset. I can't do what I have to do. You have to help me. I can't make this work. And maybe we found ourselves in those places. That's why Jesus' words in Matthew 25 cut to the heart. We have to face the truth about ourselves, that we stand in need of help. And maybe we've been the ones who've received it. Maybe we've been the one who needed food or clothing or shelter or a place to belong. When have we not served Christ and shown the love of God? There are challenges here. For the first listeners who heard Jesus tell this parable, there might have been this expectation that Jesus was talking about the Jew and Gentile divide that was facing that community. This was about being of the right ethnic group and a religious group, sheep and the goats. But Jesus blows that expectation apart, and the divide is along an entirely different line. This is not about ethnic identity at all. This is about how faith is lived out and the reality that we can't separate our relationship with God from our relationship with others. Not just the others we want to serve, but all of God's people, all of God's family. Maybe Jesus is focused on the fact that those who know of their relationship with him, who understand some sense of grace and forgiveness, should have no question about what it looks like to respond. Because if we look at the whole of Scripture, God is always concerned about the most vulnerable. Always. And God always calls us to be active in alleviating the struggles in whatever way we can, offering support and encouragement and practical aid. God helps, and so should we. Maybe our role can be to flip the script what we want to do with all of these tech truths to change the cliche into something helpful and meaningful, to something that tells us about ourselves and about the people around us. Grace and mercy show us that God helps those who cannot help themselves. God helps the helpless 
That helps because we can't help ourselves. We need God's help. And thankfully, God does help us. Now, none of this diminishes the need for personal responsibility for responding to God's grace, but it reminds us of our call to help each other as a response to God's help in our lives. It may be practical help, it may be spiritual help, but the two are connected, and the most important part is our witness to who God is and what God is like. God helps those who help themselves does not tell us the truth about who God is and what God is like. God shows compassion and mercy when we struggle. God, who is rich in mercy. The hope that we have, the prayer that we have, the goal that we have, is to reflect God who is love. It's to reflect God who has helped us in our need. And so we help each other. That's my prayer, but I hope it becomes more than a prayer. God, help me help others. Okay? That's a prayer, but maybe being aware of the needs, maybe being open to the Spirit's leading and guiding. Where do you want me to love and serve? That's my prayer. And I hope my prayer and your prayer move us to action. Let us pray for this morning. Gracious God, we gather together thankful to be a part of the body of Christ, thankful for the ways that we have received help and hope from you and from each other, grateful for the ways that we can offer it and know that it blesses us when we do. And so today we pray on this day that is an anniversary of a difficult, terrible day. So many years ago, we still remember it. We remember where we were. And we pray that you would guide us to be people of peace and hope. For you are our refuge and our strength. And so when we feel the stress, help us to come to you. As we remember the shock and horror of a tragic day, even though some of that has subsided, subsided, we pray for a longing. We pray with longing for what was lost. We remember those who lost their lives. We pray for their families as they continue to wait for justice. We're mindful of the sacrifice of public public servants and and first responders who demonstrated the greatest love of all by laying down their lives for others. We commit their souls to your eternal care. We come remembering and we come in hope not in what we can do, but in what you can do in us. Foundations were shaken. And so we pray that you would help us move beyond the illusions of security that we feel, that we would trust in you, our helper, our keeper. Thank you for your presence in every time of need. And hear our prayers for a world in need. We pray for your church in every place that we, who confess your name, would be united in your love, that we would reveal your glory to the world. Guide the people of this country, of every nation, in the ways of peace and justice, that we would all seek to honor one another and serve the common good. Help us to care for your good creation, to use its resources well in service of others, and to give you glory. Bless the lives of all those who are closely linked with ours in our celebrations and in our worries for one another. Help us to love one another as you love us. 
We pray today for those who need healing and comfort, who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, that they would have courage and hope in their troubles, that they would know the joy of your love, and that we would reach out in love and service to you. We pray for those who come to mind as we think about the saints, people who have loved and served you and have helped us. Help us to follow the examples, your example, in the ways that we have seen it lived out in others. And hear all the prayers of our hearts today. In the name of Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Friends, as we go out into the world to love and serve God and neighbor, I'd invite you to stand as you're able and we'll sing the first four verses of Amazing Grace. go from here, and may we know the truth that grace and mercy teach us that God helps those who cannot help themselves. God helps us as we are helpless to know God's grace without God's love. God's love and faithfulness lead us every day. May they lead us to love God more fully, to love neighbor more, more boldly. Go in peace and make peace. Amen.